यसो मत्ती नन्दन Hey, oh, Oh, 
ಜಾಮೂನ ತತ್ವಚಾರ ಗೋಪೀರ್ವ ಸನೋಹಾರ ಶ್ರೀರಾರ ಹರಿ his mother calls him he doesn't come <laughs> Tana, beautiful name, Krishna. Okay, this is the Srimad Bhagavatam, 10th canto, 60th chapter, Krishna teases Rukmini, verse number 2. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Yastvaita Lilaya Vishwam Srija Atyad Avadvati Srija Atyadvati Ishwaraha Sadhi jatam svasetunam Kaupitaya yadushvajaha <coughs> Yastvetal lilaya vishvam Srijati ati avasti svishati avasti shvaraha Sahi jata swasetunam Kopitaya yadushvajaha Yas twelta lilayad vishvam Srijati atya avistishvaraha Sahi jata swasetunam Kopitaya yadushvajaha Thank you. 
lights. You can shut them off. Yeah, we don't need them. Ladies? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who? Two and a tuck this Lilaya as his play Vishwam Universe Srinjati sends forth a tea devours Avati protects Ishwaraha <clears throat> the Supreme Controller. Sa, he, he, indeed, Jata, born, Swa, his own, Se tu nam, of the laws, Kopitaya, for the protection, Yadusu, among the Yadus, Ajaha, the unborn Lord. <clears throat> So this is uh, Sri Badrayan. It's another. It's another name for Sukadev Goswami, I believe. The unborn personality of Godhead, the supreme controller, who creates, maintains, and then devours this universe simply as his play, took birth among the Yadus to preserve his own laws. Mm -hmm. Purport by his disciples of his divine grace, A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. As stated in the sixth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, 6 3 19, Dharmam Stu Shakshad Bhagavatam Pranitam. Religion is the law established by God. The word Setu means a boundary or limit, as in the case of a dike. Earth is raised up on both sides of a river or canal so that the water will not deviate from its proper path. Similarly, God establishes laws so that people who follow them can peacefully progress along the path back home, back to Godhead. These laws, which are meant to guide human behavior, are thus called setu. A further, a further note on the word setu means earth that is raised up to separate agricultural fields or to form a causeway or bridge is also called setu. Thus in the ninth canto of the Bhagavatam uses the word setu to indicate the bridge Lord Ramachandra built to Sri Lanka. Since the laws of God act as a bridge to take us from the material world life, material life to liberated spiritual life, this additional sense of the word Satya certainly enriches it as its use here. Omagyan timirandasya gina jena salakaya chaksu unmilitam yenatas my shri gurave namaha nama om vishnu padaya krishna prasthaya bhutale shimakti bhakti Divedanta Swami Iti Namine, Namaste Saraswati Deve, Gaudavani Pacharine, 
Here we say sa sunyavadi pastyatya de satarine pancha kalpa tarubhischa kripa sindhu bevucha patitanam pavane bhyo vaishnave bhyo namaho namaha jai sri krishna chaitanya prabhu nityananda sri advaita gadadara sivasadi gor bhakta rinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Mm. Mm. Dharmam tu shakshak bhagavani bhagavatam panitam. Religion is the law established by God. They say that there's different kinds of religion. And they quote different what we call passive faith. We say Hindu or Muslim or Jewish, Christian, and there are a number of other prominent paths. But these are not different. The point is that religion is one. Religion simply means, means to follow the laws of God. So if you follow the laws of God as a Christian, then you're a good follower. If you follow the laws as God, as a, as a Hare Krishna, then you are following properly. The laws are there in every, we say, tradition that springs up as a particular path by which people can follow a set of principles which are the foundation by which religion is executed, and that is called the rules and regulations. Call them vidis and nishedas, things to do and things to avoid. As I mentioned here, they keep us on the path. They give us the right direction by which we can proceed towards the goal. And what is the goal of religion? The goal of religion is premu uh, pumarta mahan, means to develop one's natural love for God. There's no second goal. Any other goal that may be established as authorized is an intermediate goal by which one can progress to ultimately the, the real goal, and that is to develop one's love for Krishna, or God. But nowadays, people like to manufacture things. <clears throat> they like to create their own rules, regulations, laws, and consider them to be bona fide. But it's just like if you live in a particular country and there are laws that are established by the government in that country to guide the citizens in a particular way. And these laws are established as those things you follow. And if you don't, you break the law, you're considered a, a violator and there is some punishment coming. But nowadays, people think that just like using that example, well, I can make my own law, just like Prabhupada would always say. In America, it says, keep to the right. But if you go to London, you keep to the left. Or India, keep to the left. Australia, keep to the left. Most countries of the world are keep to the right, some are keep to the left. So you say, I like to drive on the right side no matter where I am. But you get arrested, or maybe you have an accident. If you do that in countries where keep to the left is the, is the principle. So you can't make your own laws. You have to follow the laws of the authority. And in this case, the authority is the, the person who makes the laws. There are, as there are laws, there's lawmakers too. You can't say laws are just uh, manifestations of the material energy and they appear at a certain time and that's what we follow. And therefore they come and go, and therefore we can just change the laws because they're all so temporary. But then, and that's another way of cheating. No one has to follow the principles as given and by the, by the Supreme Person who is the establishment of the Lord. As Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Sarvasya Hamradi Sani Visto, Matasmita jnanam pohanam cha vedaischa saham aham eva vedyo vedantakrit vedavit eva chaham. I am the compiler of the Vedas, Krishna says. I am the knower of the Vedas. 
and the Vedas are meant to know me. So the conclusion is that one follows the principles given by the Shastras and explained and also maybe adjusted according to time, place, and circumstance by the pure devotee spiritual master. And one can stay on the path of devotional service. Just like we have these simple rules. No illicit sex, no intoxication, no meat eating, and no gambling. So why? Why do we follow those? because they're the pin of pillars of sinful activities. So if we stay within the confines of obeying the restrictions, then we can actually execute the positive in a very, what we say, successful way. But it's just like sometimes I see devotees, they know what to do, but they don't know what not to do. <laughs> we have a tendency to make mistakes and do the wrong thing which sort of minimizes or dilutes the progress we make by doing the right things. So these two co concepts of the rules are both important, things to, things to follow and things to not to do. Both of them are equally beneficial in the sense of bringing one closer to the Supreme Lord in devotional service. So that is the meaning of this statement, Dharma, to Shakshak Bhagavani Panitam, that, that those laws cannot be changed. Prabhupada was talking about that. <clears throat> Just like there are, uh, there, the Vedas are divided into two aspects. One is called Shruti, and one is called Smriti. Shruti are actually the, the essence of the Vedas, the four Vedas along with the Upanishads. These are the Vedas. And then you have the Puranas, and you have the Itihastras, and you have the, uh, uh, the Dharma Shastras also. Many different aspects of the Vedas. But these are known as Smriti. So what is Smriti? Smriti means the commentaries on the, on the Shruti according to the Acharya's time, place, and circumstance. So that's not a change, that's just an illustration of how they apply accordingly. It's like when Prabhupada came to the, the West, he knew he couldn't establish Krishna consciousness the same way it is established in India. Because the climate and the culture of the Western mentality was much different. And he knew it was so set within that way that to change it would be impossible. So therefore he adopted certain things. For instance, he, uh, in India, generally within the temples, the men run all of the temples and the women come from the outside. They live outside, they take part in the activities, but they don't live within the ashrams. <laughs> and maybe there are women's ashrams, but they're separate from the temples. But Prabhupada knew to try to do that in America would be impossible and it would be a revolution. <laughs> so he understood, well, of course he understood the principle that the spirit soul is equal in both man and women. So both should give complete opportunities or uh, what we say, same opportunities to engage in devotional service. And Prabhupada was criticized for that. He's criticized for that and for making that adjustment. And But the criticism Prabhupada used to say, but I have become successful because of that. <laughs> I have become successful. So he knew how to deal with the cultural climate in such a way that he adopted a principle that was not normally followed from the tradition, but somehow or other was successful. But only a dancharya can do that. So someone thinks, well, you know, I have to adjust things also because uh, I don't like the way it goes. <laughs> or I think it'll, be go, it'll go better if I just do it this way. Then that won't work because one has to be authorized to do that. And therefore, only one who is the acharya can do that, no one else. Acharya means one who comes into succession from Krishna ultimately. And they... They understand the scriptures, they practice that understanding in their own devotion, 
and they can adjust things only within the realm of practice. They don't change the philosophy. That's one they don't change. Sometimes people like to change the philosophy too to make it sound a little bit more pleasing. <laughs> Sometimes some of the words of the philosophy, the philosophical teachings are a little strong, especially for the Western mentality. So they think, well, maybe we should change it to make it more palatable, more easily understandable. There is a, a room for that, but separate. You can't do it within the revealed scriptures. You can write books on that, which illustrate the same principles, but using language that maybe is more easily understood and more easily applicable. Because if you read the Vedas, you'll get confused. The Vedas are even, even, even the Vedavadaratas, those who are expert in the Vedas, they have a difficult time understanding the Vedas. Therefore, that's why the Vedas are divided into Shruti and Smirti. What is Bhagavad Gita? Bhagavad Gita is not Shruti, Shruti, it's Smirti. Krishna is speaking on the principles of the Vedas and giving, his, giving us the understanding in the language that is applicable to time, place, and circumstance. And that's, and so therefore, even Bhagavad Gita is not Shruti, it's Smirti. Smritis cannot be changed, but they're, they're adjusted by time, place, and circumstance, and only by the Acharyas. So, therefore, the rules and regulations and restrictions and the process itself always remains intact. But there is a different angle of vision. Just like you can see a mountain from one side, you can look at it from another side, you can look at it from another side. It looks different, but it's the same mountain. It's the same mountain. So, the, as it's explained here, only the Lord, uh, he is the establisher of religious principles. And therefore, we have to follow whatever Krishna says, or whatever the pure devotee who is representing Krishna says, we cannot, adjust, we cannot just make up our own ideas, rules, regulations, and changes. And sometimes you see that people who have great philosophical acumens, they have ability to understand philosophy, they like to adjust things within the actual text itself. But that becomes an opera or becomes a deviation. Because just like we, what do we sing? Brindayai Tulsi Devai Priyayai Kesa Vastacha Vishnu Bhakti Pradidevi Sachavachai Namaho Namaha. So we all know she's Krishna Bhakti, right? But Prabhupada said you can't change the language in the scriptures. In the scriptures, it's written that way Vishnu Bhakti. So although we know that she is Krishna Bhakti, it's still the scriptures giving us an understanding that this is how it's under how it's explained so we have to follow the vedic mantras and not adjust the mantras according to what we think is more appropriate or more exact to the philosophical teachings so this uh this uh, understanding has to be clear because there are those who like to change things <laughs> change 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 do something new. But what it, what is actually religious principles? And they're eternal. The religious principles are eternal. Of course, there are some temporary religious principles that applies to certain activities. But ultimately, religious principles, as far as the execution of the process of pure devotional service, they're eternal. And so, those principles can... They remain intact in any and every particular circumstance. So that one has to understand that and not try to adjust things to make it seem to be more suitable. Like, like when, well, this is not a religious principle, but it's an instructions of the, the spiritual master. We had the problem in New York Temple many years ago 
when a group of the sannyasis and some of the leading men there thought the women should not chant japa in the temple. They can chant in another room in the, in the building, or they can chant outside. And then they start moving the women from the back, front to the back. Mm -hmm. This idea of women standing in the back is not Prabhupada's idea. The women can stand all the way up on the front, on the one side, and the men on the other. But these sannyasis thought, well, you know, it's not good for the brahmacharis. So, uh, you know, let's restrict the women to a more safer place for us. <laughs> when Prabhupada found out about that, he was quite upset. And he said, if the brahmacharis are agitated, they can go to the forest. <laughs> they can go to the forest. <laughs> so, and he said, then they have no problems. There's nothing there they can be bothered with. <laughs> Maybe. So that was, so these are, there were so many ideas. And then they said, well, women can't do, can't go on the altar. That was another thing that they adjusted. And Prabhupada found out about that, and then he changed it back. That went on for a long time, because Prabhupada didn't find out about it right away. And that was happening for a little, well, actually for a couple of years, till Prabhupada became aware of it. So these are just basic pro protocols. But then again, changing, just like changing some of the statements in Prabhupada's books, became very fashionable to bring it closer to the meaning. But it says you can't change the words of the Acharya. And when, even when Prabhupada was here, and they were changing in his words. He said, they, Prabhupada would say, what are they doing? Why are they changing? This is, and then Prabhupada, one day they were, he was given a class, and then they were giving the word for word translation. And it had, uh, the word was, uh, let me see, what was the word? Goraksha. Goraksha. So they put down cattle raising for Goraksha in the book. Cattle raising. Papa said, what is this cattle raising? Cow protection. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes in order to patronize the uh, the particular atmosphere, social, political atmosphere. They want to adjust things so to make it more understandable to Prabhupada. But it says, especially posthumously, one can never change the words of the Acharyas because that becomes an opera and that's an offense. <clears throat> So these are just examples of how the laws Dharma Shaktu Shaksha Bhagavadam Pranitam are given by the Lord or by his pure devotee. Only they can actually teach the principles of religion. So whether you follow the, the laws given by Krishna directly or you follow the laws given by Krishna through his pure devotee, which is also direct, it's the same. It's the same. Like that. And here there's a nice example, the word Setu. You know, there's a place in South India called Setu Banda, where it's the place where the bridge was made, where when the monkey soldiers had to cross the ocean and they needed a way to cross, and Ram Chandra was there. And so they decided to build a bridge and they were throwing rocks into the water, but they were writing the name of Ram on the rocks. And because of that, although these big boulders were floating, big boulders don't float, they go down. <laughs> but because of the power of the Lord's name, the boulders were floating, and then they made this bridge all the way across, 800 miles across the ocean. 88, while, 88, 88 miles wide and 800 miles long. 
So that's called a bridge or a guide or a say to. So here it's an interesting that the laws of God are also called say to because they are the bridge by which we follow the path going back home, back to Godhead. So I remember in New Vrindavan, there was, it was fashionable to change things to make it apparently more westernized. But also it got to the point of changing things that were foundational. Now there's two things, there's a principle and there's a detail. Principles can never be changed. Just like it says, the, the Acharya has established that in order to qualify for initiation, one has to chant 16 rounds and follow the four regulative principles. That's a principle. And a, a, a detail is, well, you could chant those 16 rounds throughout the day. Of course, if you chant them in the morning, it's the, it's the most but, you know, it's not like it's fixed. You have to chant only in the morning. So that's a detail. So one time, Shuti Kirti, Srila Prabhupada's servant, asked him, well, Prabhupada's saying you can't change principles, but you can change de details. And the, Prabhupada's, and the question was, how do you know the difference? Now, how do you know the difference between a principle and a detail? And then Prabhupada's answer was, that requires intelligence. <laughs> that's all, that's the whole answer. And that means not, not everyone may, may not be able to understand the distinction, but one should get that intelligence or hear from those who know, and then one can understand. Because there are details, you know, just like it, in India, certain rules and regulations are applied, but in the West, it's not applied. <laughs> so, because of the, certain, the culture and the tradition and the principles. But these are details. But when it comes to a principle, I remember in New Vrindavan, we were, we had the idea that you could you didn't have to chant 16 rounds, you have to chant two hours. So the estimation was, usually you can finish 16 rounds in two hours. So it was a time chanting program, not a numerical chant. So that went on, but not everyone was able to do 16 rounds in two hours, and, not, and some people could do it in less than two hours. So, and that was a principle that got adjusted and ultimately things started to become a little less spiritually powerful and then things started to fall apart because there was a lot of changes of the principles. You can't change the principles yet and then you have to know what is the principle and what is the detail. And they're all there in the scriptures, they're given by the spiritual master are given by the pure devotee, are given by the Lord himself. <clears throat> so one should hear regularly from this process of hearing, Sramibhuta, Svakata, Krishna, Punya, Shravana, Kirtanaha, Vridhyanto, Stoa, Bhadrani, Vidyanoti, Suhet, Satam. One has to hear regularly. And by hearing regularly, then Krishna within the heart purifies the devotee and gradually brings them closer and closer to the to the stage of pure devotional service. So this process of hearing is very important. In fact, it's the foundation. Out of all of the nine processes of devotional service, hearing accompanies all of the other eight. <laughs> the most important principle is chanting. As Prabhupada said, you have to chant Hare Krishna. That one's not optional. But then again, there are Hearing, remembering, chanting, worshiping, praying, serving, serving the lotus feet, becoming a friend, and ultimately surrendering everything. These are the nine processes. But before you can do any one of them, you have to have an understanding of how to do it, or what is the process by which one performs that activity. And therefore, the process of hearing is important. 
because they're also adjusted according to time, place, and circumstance as far as how they apply. We have to hear. And that means we have to read these books every day, not just when we have time. <laughs> but we have to hear every day because then we get nourishment, just like we sing. Guru Mukha Padma Vakya Chite Te Koriya Aikya. This Guru Mukha Padma Vakya, the words of the spiritual master, are my nourishment. <laughs> They're my food. We get food, we get nourishment uh, for the, on the bodily and mentally level from food, air, and various types of healthy living. But then again, what is the spiritual nourishment? Hearing from the spiritual master, hearing from the scriptures, and uh, not only hearing, but understanding. Not only understanding, but trying to uh, apply that knowledge in practice. Then the knowledge becomes complete. So therefore, it's a whole process. Of it. But the more you hear, the more you understand. The more you understand, the more it's easier for you to understand how to apply. And the application is also given along with the process of practice, how they apply. But then again, individuals are different, and therefore the application might be slightly different for each and every individual, but the principles are the same, that the knowledge can never be adjusted but applied accordingly. So one has to hear regularly. Because by hearing regularly, we have Sukadev Goswami. He was chanting and Maharaj Parikshit heard. Parikshit heard for seven full days. And after seven days, he was fully Krishna conscious simply by the process of hearing. Because he heard in a certain way. There is different ways to hear. If your mind is wandering on different subject matters, while the sound vibration is being given, you're not really connecting with the sound. You're getting, you just, sometimes we do that when we chant Hare Krishna. We're chanting and the sound is coming out, but our minds are somewhere else. So although there is some sound coming in, we're not actually connecting with the essence of the heart and the name. We have to hear with attention. And attention has to be applied. It can't, it's not just something that's in the air and it just, it'll happen. You have to force your mind to hear. You have to force your mind to listen, both in the reading process and in the uh, hearing process. Because the mind is what? Chanchala. Goes everywhere and anywhere. <laughs> It's, that's its nature. And therefore, in the Padma Purana, it explains there is a series of principles that make up the process of successful hearing. And then you can test yourself whether you're hearing or not based on these principles. And the first one is faith in the person who is speaking. In other words, the, wo the words are authorized. In other words, those you, you should hear from only authorized sources. And then you can accept that, that this is whatever is being said is truth. The second thing is humility. And that is not to filter the sound vibration through our own ideas. Try to hear in a, in a way of, of absorbing rather than trying to, you know, oh. I guess the, the way the way to be was we try to compare it to other things. And the third thing is, and this is the most important, destroying the faults of the mind. And that means wherever the mind wanders, bring it back to the sound. The mind will wander. It's just the nature of the mind. It goes here, it goes there, it goes, goes to India, it goes to, you know, he goes to Vrindavan in India. He goes to the grocery store. Goes to what I have to do later on today. Goes to what happened yesterday that I didn't like. You know, it goes to everything. <laughs> this way the mind goes. But by forcing the mind 
to hear the sound vibration gradually. I had that experience on the plane just when I was coming over to America. I was on the plane and I was listening to Prabhupada. But I, was, I noticed I wasn't really fully connected to the sound, so I forced my mind to listen. And I just kept listening, listening, listening. And after some time, it became so nice and everything became so clear that I didn't, didn't want to stop the process of hearing. It was just so powerful. When you force your mind into that context or into that avenue of, of shravanam, after a while, you're, you're actually getting realizations from what you hear. And that's the fourth part of these, these, these four things, is that if you're actually hearing, you'll get two things. You'll get realizations on what you hear, or you'll get questions. One of the two. So if you're getting realizations, that means you understood and you accept. That means you, yeah, oh yes, that's, that's correct. I understand that. It's more like the experience of eating. Eating is an experience. If you sit there and read the menu, and you think, wow, I ate. <laughs> what kind of eating is that? <laughs> you have to actually, you know, take the food. And then it has a certain effect on you. So in the same way, when we're actually hearing and we get realizations, it has an effect changes our consciousness or elevates our consciousness. And the second thing is, even if realizations don't come, there should be questions in order to get clarifications and understanding so we can go deeper into them or we can get a clear understanding of what the knowledge is and how it applies to us. There are knowledge that is general, but then the application comes in the form of understanding by asking questions. So when we ask questions, then everything becomes clear. So this is the process of hearing. And Prabhupada writes in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, once you hear with rapt attention. But then he says, you can't hear with rapt attention unless you're pure in mind. <laughs> and you can't be pure in mind unless you're pure in activity, action. And you can't be pure in activity unless you're pure in eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. In other words, regulating the four bodily activities. And then he says, but then he goes on to say, somehow try to hear. <laughs> in other words, even if you haven't got to that stage of pure, pure consciousness, make that effort to hear because it's the foundation by which one gets all knowledge and realization everything becomes clear. It's just like, how many times have we heard, you're not this body? <laughs> I mean, we hear it over and over in the scriptures, it comes in the lectures, when you're not this body. That's a certain type of hearing, but then if you hear it with complete attention and your mind is in, in an absorbing mood, then you realize that, yes, I'm not this body. It becomes a realization as opposed to just picking up the sound vibration. So that's the difference between jnan and vigyan, knowledge and understanding or realized knowledge like that. So we are meant to come to that platform of realization because only on the platform of realization can you understand Krishna or we understand the process of devotional service. So practice this hearing process as much as you can. And you'll see things become easy and more and more uh, clear in how to practice devotional service in the most effective and the most uh, successful way. In other words, you're making progress. Okay, so can't see the clock. But... 8.28. I think that's I'm supposed to stop by 8.30, right? Any questions, comments? We have question, two questions, one here and one there, three. Okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you so much for the class. 
Um, I thought of two questions, but I'm going to ask this one first. Um, you know, Prabhupada gave us very um, clear instructions on principles for the temple. Um, and as you mentioned, sometimes we see how things start to move away from those very clear instructions. And, and then, you know, difficulties obviously manifest. How we as a community, as a, as a community of devotees can bring, come back to those principles of establishing those clear guidelines that Srila Prabhupada gave us for how a temple should function, the activities of the temple, and even as a temple residents and temple devotees. Yeah. So if it's clear, then there's, all you do is follow. <laughs> but if it's clear, but at the same time, there are so many extenuating circumstances or changes that happened since that time that happened, then you have to understand how does it apply. And that requires honesty or purity. Purity means that I want to follow the process exactly as the process is giving. That's purity. Purity means I don't, I don't add or anything to it. I don't take away anything to it. So if one is serious to do to follow the process, one should understand it, read it, understand it, and if there's no if it's not clear, or if there's some other considerations that make it unclear, that, that requires some discussions. Because, just like I'll give you an example. Uh, I was at a North American uh, temple president's meeting many years ago. And we were in Tawako, in New Jersey. This was... I mean, really long time ago, maybe 20 years ago. So it was, Prabhupada had said that the profits from the book distribution, half of those process, profits that are made in America should go to support the temples in India. And Prabhupada said that. That was... When Prabhupada was here, because book distribution was really strong in America in those days. Now, fast forward to, to you know the year 2000, I think it was around that time. The temples in India were flourishing, starting to flourish, and America was going down. So then the question came, should we still give half of the profits of the book distribution that was made in America to support the temples in India? They were still doing it. And then the, the answer was no, because obviously things changed. So then, the, then they stopped that, like that. So that was, that was an obvious and an honest and a very, you know, intelligent way to understand the temples in America are going down, temples in India are, are starting to flourish, why cut away the American funds when they need it here <laughs> more than they do in India? So things just changed. So some people might say, well, you broke Prabhupada's instructions. No, the situation changed. So that was, but that was a practical thing. And then there are the philosophical teachings, those don't change. But they also require understanding and how to apply those things. So if it's clear, then there's no question. You simply go ahead and execute it the way it's given. If it's not clear, then with a group of senior devotees who are committed to the upkeep of the temple, then there should be some discussion on how to understand these things in the light of uh, the present situation. 
That's why Prabhupada said this movement, when, when Prabhupada was in, I forget where he was, but it was the middle of the night Prabhupada had been doing his translations. So uh, he, uh, Prabhupada, if he needed his servant, the servant usually slept outside the door where Prabhupada was. And if Prabhupada needed him, Prabhupada would ring his bell. And then the servant would wake up. But this time the servant was Giriraj, was Giriraj Brahmachari at the time. And so he came in, paid his obeisances to Srila Prabhupada, and Prabhupada was in a very thoughtful mood. He said, how will this movement go on after I'm gone? He posed that question. And Giri Raj was saying, well, you know, we'll, you know, we'll chant our rounds every day. We'll go, Mongol, go to Mongol RT. We'll go out and distribute books. But that's not what Prabhupada was wanting to hear. He wanted to hear a principle and not so much an activity. So Prabhupada gave the principle. He said, this movement will go on by organization and intelligence. by organization and intelligence. So he said, we are highly organized, and therefore it requires intelligence on how to organize in the best possible way, and how to apply and how to you know, adjust whenever in the situation is required. That requires intelligence, and intelligence should be fueled or supported by purity. In other words, honesty that one wants to do what Srila Prabhupada has given us and not simply in interjecting their own ideas because it has some benefit for me. So some of the instructions may be easily applicable and others may require some austerity. <laughs> but in either case, they have to be executed. That's the point. So I think organization and intelligence is the answer. <laughs> but then again, those who know, the persons who have or in, in that position of leadership, they're expected to give organization. And they're expected to give guidance, which is the intelligence by which the organization is formulated and will work. <laughs> so I can't give you a straight answer. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, not everything is so easy. <laughs> Yeah, Hare Krishna. What's your name? Hare Krishna, my name is Donovan. Da Donovan. Donovan? Yeah. Okay. Our founder, Acharya, is there now or potentially in the future someone we can look to as an Acharya in this uh, day and age or near future? Prabhupada is the founder of Charya for all times, all places, and all devotees. He has established the principles and the process, and everything is there in his books. He said, my books will be the law books for the next 10,000 years. So his duly represented disciples who have taken the responsibility of uh, the same activity that he's done. In other words, the gurus in our movement are meant to be, what we say, what's the word? Transparent via media to Srila Prabhupada. They're meant to give us Srila Prabhupada. So we're getting Srila Prabhupada through them, but we're not getting something different. <laughs> so, we don't need anything new or another person to come in and somehow or other adjust things because then everything will be 
and people become confused and then there will simply be factions. Everything there is in Prabhupada's books. If you want to know his movement, read his books. He says, they're in my books. His lectures are also good, but the books are solid. The lectures also sometimes apply to certain principles of time and place. The books you can use as an eternal application for all of the practice of devotional service. So, um, and those who represent Srila Prabhupada, the gurus in the movement, are meant to be mediums by which we, they, we can give Srila Prabhupada to others. So we don't need anybody else. We simply need the process by which we can understand Prabhupada more and more. And so everything is there. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Namaz, Dhanavad, Dhanavad. Thank you. Um, this verse, Bahu Nam Janmante Gyanaman Maam Prabhadyantiv. After many lives, one who sees knowledge is understood to me. Such a personality is very rare. Then it says, Sarvadharman Paritikya Maam Ekam Sharanavrita. I mean, Sharanan to me. So that's the stage of sannyas. Like. No, that's, that's, that's surrender. Yes, yeah, surrender. Complete surrender. So. In this verse, especially Rukmini, Lord Krishna is teasing Rukmini. Yeah, that, that's coming up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but the title is uh, Lord Krishna teases Rukmini. So, when uh, in childhood, our consciousness is pure, like, so, so when we grow, our consciousness becomes impure. So, generally, the teasing attitude in material world is prominent, like, if that's called eve teasing, in other words. Say that again. Lord Krishna is teasing Rukmini right. in this chapter. Mm -hmm. The title is that. In this material world, it's it's in a perverted reflection. It's eve teasing, like teasing opposite male yeah. or female, whatever. Yeah, but his teasing has a meaning to it. He, he's doing it for a certain reason. Yeah. So in childhood, our consciousness is pure. As we grow, our consciousness becomes pure. Yeah, so, well, yeah. Uh, so, then we start to think we know something. Yeah. <laughs> so so I, I, my mother taught me, in, like, you stay away from opposite this. Like, I was shy in a sense. So, but... Uh, we can we in then we as we grow up we can be bewildered because we have four defects conditioned souls has four defects right so one is to commit mistakes uh, this sense enjoyment prominent and but we trap the mode of passion and mode of ignorance very prominent yeah. and, the cheating propensity is there yeah. too <laughs> yeah so mode of passion and mode of ignorance very prominent so that means we go downwards uh, we don't have to go down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We don't. If we... So, but by mercy of a sadhu, <laughs> we can overcome. Otherwise, like it's a crocodile trap. Yeah. Uh, this. <laughs> yeah, so, this hearing process has to be continuous. Can't just hear and think, well, now I know it, and then I'll have to hear again. No. <laughs> because the material energy is always pushing us. These two mother modes are, are very prominent. You have to constantly hear, continuously hear. So on hearing uh, this Mukund Mala Stotra, it says that now I'm quite young. In Mukunda Mala Stotra, yeah. King Kulakshetra, he prays that now I'm quite very young. He gives the example of Swan, Swan entering yeah. deep into the lotus stem. Right. Uh, so I can remember. So what's that exactly means? Diving deep in this, uh, like what is the swan. the meaning of that analogy? Yeah. Well, this, the swan goes into the goes into the stems of the lotus flower and gets the essence. Mm -hmm. So going deep means to get the essence. Mm -hmm. 
instead of just skimming the surface. Skimming the surface means you may hear something and it may sound in a certain way, but going deep means to absorb yourself in the process. So then you just like in the Astanga yoga system, there are different stages. One is dharana, dhyani, and samadhi. These are different stages of absorption. So as you go, the, the analogy is that he wants to go deep into the lotus feet. In other words, he wants full shelter of Krishna's lotus feet. He doesn't want to come out. <laughs> he doesn't want anything else. He simply wants to go deep. And that's the nature of a swan. And a swan also has another quality which is also similar to this point, and that is a swan, you take water and, and milk and you mix them together, the swan can drink the milk from the water and leave the water. It takes the essence, or takes the, yeah. So a devotee is therefore called hamsa, which means swan. The devotee takes the, the good or the essence of everything and leaves whatever else is there. Now, what is the essence? Now, the essence of spiritual practice is to, to please the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That's the essence of spiritual practice. Rather than just getting the job done. Just getting the job done is getting it done. But to, to act in such a way that one uses their intelligence, absorption into the activity in such a way that they, you want to make that as an offering to the Lord with a, the with a desire to please the Lord by that offering. Mm. So, the body doesn't doesn't like to skim the surface. They want to go deep to the essence. Skimming the surface means just going through the motions, doing it mechanically, and and seeing the activities as just material, <laughs> but they're not. Every activity in devotional service is an opportunity to offer your devotion to Krishna. It's not just a, something we do just to get it done. Okay, does that help a little bit? <laughs> yeah, okay, one more question and then maybe... Any of the ladies have questions? Oh yeah, we have Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Um, I'm not sure, yeah. Okay, then. <laughs> uh, thank you for the class. And uh, my question is related to philosophy and practical application. And, um, and, um, what I am facing as a challenge is that there are uh, certain people who are very good with the philosophy. Um, they know the ins and outs of philosophy. But it, when it comes to dealing with devotees and practical application, um, the uh, words do not match the actions. That means they don't know the philosophy. They memorized it, that's all. <laughs> Knowing it means to, to carry it out. You can memorize anything. You can memorize a statement in a foreign language and to impress people who are over that same language. But that doesn't mean you know what it means. <laughs> Memorization is one thing. Knowing is a complete other thing. Knowing means following. 
As we say, we say, if you know what's right, do it. So my challenge is that um, when I'm dealing with such people, like I'm getting affected. Uh, my consciousness, I feel, is degrading because I see the same repetitive action and I, I really cannot do much about it. Mm. So it's how do I protect my consciousness when I'm dealing with such people and I really uh, have understood that I cannot change much about it. Hmm. So you're saying you can't get away from it because it involves your required services. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hmm. It's affecting me like well, very deeply. Like. Well, then you have to say something. <laughs> you can... Why you can't let your... Saying if you is allow also someone to do something to harm you, you're also guilty of harming yourself. That's a statement. You you should never allow people to harm you. You either have to get away from that or adjust in such a way as you're not affected in that same way. Yeah, you have to do something about it. Explain that what is happening is not palatable to me or somehow or other go to an authority in order to get things, you know, cleared. You can't allow people to har har harm you and then continue to go on like that. As you say, it affects you. And if it affects you so much, you, you you can actually get sick from that physically. Because, you know, mental distress causes physical problems also. So, yeah, you can't allow that, you can't allow that to happen. You have to do something either to counteract it or to avoid it, either one. Or to ameliorate it in such a way that it doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> so, then you, then you have to, you might require some assistance in getting, getting a solution. Sometimes you have to go to a, an authority and say, this is the situation, I can't, this is what's happening, well, please help. <laughs> Or you may also approach the person who's causing you the distress and explain that this is what's happening. <laughs> and um, ask them why they're acting like that. Why are you acting in that way? And they may be argumentative and even become defensive. But somehow or other, you may have to, you have to see. Prabhupada also talks about that. He quoted a verse. It's an interesting verse. And it's like during the coronavirus, people were allowing thing, people to get, to harm them in the name of getting cured. And then I found this verse. And, and it was quoted by Srila Prabhupada. I wrote it down. I can't remember what it, where it's from, but Prabhupada mentions that that if you allow someone to do harm to you, you're also causing that. You're actually causing yourself to be harmed because you have to stop that or avoid that somehow. And it's usually done verbally. Obviously, if it's physically, we, we, we take action when it's verbal. But when it's verbal, sometimes we tolerate it <clears throat> and just go on. Um, but sometimes we have to somehow or other solve this problem. So if you're in that environment again, and you think, oh, no, here it's going to come again. So you just pre you sort of presuppose that, oh, here I go, I'm, I have to get ready to get in this negative attitude. So. <clears throat> but because we know the principle of, of 
Krishna consciousness is that to cause distress to anyone is an offense. So they're committing offenses. Mm -hmm. It's an offense. Mm -hmm. Body, mind, words. Three ways you can commit offenses. Mm -hmm. So that's as much as I can say. But think about it and see how and see there are different ways to solve the problem. You have to see what is the actual solution. But you can't let it go on. <laughs> That's for sure. It says that the seniors should be very affectionate to the juniors and the juniors should be very obedient to the seniors. That is the mood. Those who are in leadership should be very kind and affectionate to those that they're leading and those who are following should be very obedient to them. That is the mood. That is Prabhupada's statement. So a person in authority should not be abusive. And it is, then they don't know what it means to be in authority. Sometimes they have to correct, but it should be done in a way that people will accept and not just, you know, whatever way they want to do it. So Vaishnava etiquette is the ornament of a devotee. And you can read, Bhakti Churu Swami wrote a whole book on Vaishnava etiquette. <clears throat> and he mentions, you know, these relationships between devotees, especially in organizational relationships based on position, service, activity. Is that okay? Does that make sense? That wasn't a very enthusiastic yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, what were you thinking? Authorized <laughs> GBC members or that is true. Well, this is a controversial subject. I brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I was thinking what to say. Very controversial. But there is a, there's an effort right now to bring Prabhupada's books back to the way he gave them. It's being done by some of the leading devotees in our movement. Because I see the changes. I saw the previous one and now I'm reading the new one. Well, as Prabhupada, corrections can be made for grammar and for spelling but not word changes. And there's laws for that too. There are literary laws that, that, are, that govern the, the society where you, you can't change anything after the author has departed. And only, with, and only when he's here with his permission. But there, there can be an antidote, what they call it, what they call it, end notes, where you leave the word in process and then you write some maybe explanation in a different place within the book as an end note. That can be done because sometimes things are not clear. But you can't change the actual written words. Mm -hmm. They stay intact. Because change leads to what? Change. The more you change, the more you'll change. And then you won't be able to recognize the original after a while. So, but there's laws for that also. Not just Prabhupada's instructions, but there are also laws. 
But this is controversial because many of the persons that did this work are very senior. And um, so this is now, it's being reawakened now. This is a situation now that's happening. And there's an effort to bring back Prabhupada's books in the way they were now by redoing them again with endnotes. <laughs> <laughs> like that. So, I'll probably get a lot of questions after this class. <laughs> Maybe also get criticized for what I'm saying, but <laughs> this is what I understand. Is that all right? Okay. If you want to know more, we can talk in private. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Ruchi. I think we have to make this the last question. We're getting at nine o'clock. Oh, thank you, Ma. Thank you for the nice class. So, uh, like she was saying, that we always have problems in authority, but uh, I think all spiritual practice is a battle within and without. So if we try to stop some reaction coming from somewhere by people telling us things, uh, then it is going to come in another form. That's just my, uh, my thought. And what do you have if to you say? try to stop it, what's going to happen? No, like, because everybody has the right to, uh, everybody has the right to serve God in some or other way to come to the temple and yeah, serve. That, and that there, right is and there will always be conflicts. So a person in authority has to practice the diksha, which is like tolerance, because all spiritual practice is a battle. Oh, so you're giving a, a principle, we have to be tolerant. No, like, uh, isn't all any spiritual practice, we take any, fee, any, any religion, but it's a battle within and without, like we have to fight within ourselves and outside forces and the forces. I can't get all the words for some reason. Do you know the acoustics here, the words go up to the ceiling. If I'm sitting on the ceiling, I could hear everything you're saying. I'm over here. Well, uh, I was saying you know, that... You do, I found, and one thing I learned in this temple, I found it's easier to hear people without the microphone. Well, I was saying that all spiritual practice... Don't would, use the microphone. Go ahead. Now I can hear. All, all spiritual practice pertains to a battle within oneself and outside forces as well. So we cannot negate the outside forces. And like, what are those outside forces you're referring to? Like people telling us things and putting obstacles in our way. What, what did she say? Some, somebody's putting your obstacles in your way? Or you feel like it's no, no, like... If, if the person in authority is like having that problem. I'm not sure I understood the question. <laughs> Tolerance is understood in different ways. <clears throat> Tolerance doesn't mean only to accept and just let it go at that. That is a, that is a principle of tolerance, of course. And one can learn from that. But sometimes if somebody is speaking something against a philosophy or committing an offense by criticizing someone and you become tolerant, and then you also become implicated in that offense. You either have to go away or say something. <clears throat> but when it comes to something coming upon you, generally we, we practice tolerance just to understand what, why is Krishna allowing this to happen to me? What can I learn from this? What can I gain from this? <clears throat> yeah, there's one way of looking at it. Hmm. Thank you. Okay. 
All right, thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai.